We pray and commit all attendees that you, O Lord, will open our hearts to enjoy your Holy Communion. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. Once again, I welcome you. And today, tonight, happens to be the third lecture for our week-long transformational series, which I have dubbed Disappointment and Missed Visions. And I am very happy that at least we have been able to cover majority of the prophetic issues as far as the presentations are concerned. Once again, we have to analyze and understand clearly that before visions become rare, there would have been an imminent transition. And that is how we reviewed the first lecture where we came to the clarification that Israel as a nation, Israel as the begotten of God, went through a particular period which served as a reference point as we endeavor in this presentation of mine. The first lecture made it clear to us that indeed Israel before the judges period, that is under the leadership and the tutelage of Moses, Aaron and all the other leaders of the tribes of Judah or the tribes of Israel so to speak. There were visions concerning how Israel was going to thrive in the land of Canaan. And we are told that when they now plunged into the land of Canaan, visions ceased. Not because God didn't want to speak to them again, but because it was now time for Israel to fully reap the benefits of those visions. In the context that if Israel was obedient, then they would reap the benefits of obedience. If Israel was apostatizing or narrowing in sin, then they would reap the benefits or the consequences of a sinful way of doing things. Then we understood clearly that when this had happened, God, through his own infinite wisdom, was transitioning Israel into a kingdom, which we all know according to the biblical reckoning, that Saul happened to be the first coronated individual within the confines of Israel. Tonight, this afternoon, what I am going to discuss will be in the context of the sanctuary language. And I am directly continuing the discourse we had in our previous discussion, where we had captioned it to be the pre-advent disappointment. Friends, we were encouraged that indeed this world is going to present us with a lot of challenges as far as our preparedness is concerned. We drew lessons from the fact that John the Baptist was a close relative of Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, he, one way or the other, never fully understood the import of Christ's mission on earth. And by that, as he went along his journey, as he went along his work, being the wayfarer, the one who was supposed to make way for Jesus Christ, he once in his lifetime doubted even the mission of Christ. And he went to ask Jesus Christ, Are you the one we are expecting? Are you the Messiah? Or we are supposed to wait for another? Jesus Christ gave a resounding answer, pointing John back to the visions that he thinks he was heralding. Friends, by virtue of the image of John, we all are being represented that at times, due to the pursuance of our own dreams, due to the environments that we may find ourselves, one way or the other, we can be disappointed. Tonight, this afternoon, this evening, a door is opened before us where we are walking through the sanctuary and that will be the bedrock of our study as I continue. Visions are given 
as we have understood clearly in several parts of the Bible foretelling the happenings in this world soon to come or even now as we speak. And it is very clear why we can perfectly term this particular period that visions are rare. Because previously, even through the spirit of prophecy, visions have been given. Mind you, as we go through, I would want you to reason with me. And please don't forget, keep praying for me to have a stable network. The Advent Disappointment. I would want to review some prophecies in the Bible, which probably you have heard, or probably you are even more knowledgeable in them than me. But for the sake of repetition, as we have already discovered, the Bible is a chasm full of repetitive cycles of God's love for his nation. And for that matter, I would also want to do what God likes. That is to repeat probably what you know to you. A review of some prophecies which will make us formidable in our faith as far as prophetic staff are concerned. The Bible tells us in Exodus 27 verse 13 through 16, as I made clear in our previous discussions, the tabernacle or the sanctuary that was pitched in the wilderness had the tribe of Judah directly situated on the eastern part of the tabernacle. I want you to note this particular assertion very, very well. So it is no surprise, even though the priests were Levites, because according to the prophecy of Jacob, mind you, when Jacob was about to die, according to Genesis chapter 49, he called together his sons and gave them prophetic names and prophetic understandings concerning how their lives were going to be. When Jacob reached Judah, he told him that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. In this case, Jacob had now recognized Judah as the ultimate bearer of the whole of his sons and his daughter. In essence, all of his family. It is then no surprise that we see that Judah had been placed in the eastern side of the whole of the sanctuary. Therefore, whenever the Israelites through the priesthood were performing sacrificial work in the sanctuary, they had to come from the east and enter through the open door into the court. It is very clear that all of these things had been prefixed during the time of Abraham. Genesis chapter 22 verse 8 through 13, we are told, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the ticket of his horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. This was a prophetic something that happened in the time of Abraham. Again, we are told in Exodus 12 verse 5 through 7 concerning the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. It is clear, according to legend, that during the time of the Passover, all males, and know this very clearly, all males who were 12 years and older were to gather in Jerusalem for the celebration of the feast. Does this call an alarm in your head? If you have been following the life of Christ, especially in the Bible, you can bear with me that it is then no surprise that Jesus Christ, when he was 12 years, came to sit within Jerusalem and was contemplating with the leaders and the Pharisees and the clergy. Jesus Christ, being 12 years, had the privilege to be part of the Passover during the time that he went into Jerusalem with his parents. We are told in this particular text, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, 
Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, which is the first month of the spiritual calendar of Israel, Nisan. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Notice the particular wedding, twilight. That particular animal, the victim, would have been killed at twilight. What is the meaning of twilight here? Between two evenings, okay? In the prophetic recording of days, even in the literal recording of days, we know that a day is from an evening to another evening. And God told the Israelites that you shall kill the victim, which is the lamb without blemish, at twilight. Let's move on to another prophecy. This time in the person of Daniel chapter 9 verse 26. We are told, after the 62 weeks, and I wouldn't want you to worry your brain about the numbers for now. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. It continues, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Once again, another prophecy concerning even the time, the specific time that Jesus Christ would die. It doesn't end there. Even concerning the morning and evening sacrifice, we are told in Exodus 29 verse 38. And I hope you are noting down some of these quotes. As I move on. Now, this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb shall you offer in the morning, and the other lamb shall you offer once again at twilight. Of course, foreshadowing the ministry of Christ. Not only that, we all know the affliction that Christ went through. It was foretold prophetically in Isaiah 53 verse 7. The Bible tells us, He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep, its shearer is silent. He opened not his mouth. I cannot go on without talking about the sweet aroma that the burnt offering was supposed to produce. We who have the privilege to cook, at least, would expect our delicacies to be smelling good. Numbers chapter 15 verse 2 and 3 tells us that God also likes sweet aroma. Not in the context of perfumes, but in the context of a burnt offering. Listen to what he says. Numbers 15 2 and 3 for those who are jotting them down. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you have come into the land you are to inhabit, the one which I am giving you, you will make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice, to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering in your appointed feast. Now listen clearly. What is the effect of this? To make a sweet aroma to the Lord from the head of the flock. Wow. The questions I ask myself are these. Number one, if these prophecies were fulfilled, in essence, if these visions which were given through prophets were fulfilled, were they done in the right time? Number two, if they were really fulfilled, did they happen at the right location? And the answer is a resounding yes. Do you know that Jesus had to die at the specific day and the hour that was contemplated in the prophecies I read? Let me ask once again. He could not die one minute sooner or one minute later. Is that true? It is true indeed. Or probably you think otherwise. As we go through, you will understand why I stand to be true. Time after love, and omnipotence and the omniscience of God is the most important factor in the operations of God. Let me repeat it in a different direction. When it comes to the operations of God, 
when it comes to how God connects with his people, after his love, after his omnipotence, after his omniscience, being all-knowing, time is the most important factor. Everything that God does is bound by time. Follow me closely. John chapter 7 verse 8 tells us, You go up to this feast. I am not going up to this feast. For my time has not yet fully come. This was from Jesus Christ to his mother, Mary. Matthew 26 verse 18. Jesus again tells us this. And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Once again, Jesus hinted on the right time he was going to have Passover. Let me add on. John chapter 12 verse 23. I repeat, John chapter 12 verse 23 and 27. The Bible tells us, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? I believe you are picturing what is being talked about. When he was closing in, in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Jesus Christ fulfills the precise time that the prophecies I earlier read were supposed to take place. We can talk about a lot of references where Christ is depicted as the Passover. Again, we can also pinpoint several references where Jesus is the priest and the lamb. Not only the lamb, but a spotless priest. One who officiated and became his own sacrifice as a lamb. It is no surprise then that Acts gives us this particular version of the story. In Acts chapter 8, 32 through 36, we are told, The place in the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, talking about Christ. And who would declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the Enoch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, I hope by now you have realized that I'm giving you the account of Philip and the Enoch in the wilderness. The Enoch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Philip clarified, that indeed it was Christ who was the priest and the lamb. Once again, you may want to also clarify. Remember, I spoke about the sacrifice having a sweet aroma unto God. Where is this prophecy actually coming into pass? According to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, the offering of Christ was a sweet-smelling aroma unto God. Hear me out, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Wow! You see, prophecies are given in the Old Testament. Prophecies are being fulfilled in the New Testament. But remember, in between those testaments, I have always hammered on the nail that it was the intertestamental period, about 400 years of silence. Visions were rare. What am I trying to imply? Since the time we started this presentation or this series, I have been telling you, and I believe personally I have been learning, that whenever visions are given, right after that, there is a period of silence. Then right after that, there is a transition. Where am I driving at now? Visions were given about Jesus Christ, prophecies foretelling what he was going to do when he had come. Unfortunately, as we learned yesterday, there were pre-advent disappointments in the person of John the Baptist. 
However, as we have realized tonight again, we have seen clearly that during the time of the liberal lifestyle of the Israelites, within the intertestamental period, the 400 years of silence, where no prophets were talking, no visions were being revealed, no prophecies were running, right after that, the visions came to pass, and preceding them were signs which pointed to the coming of Christ. I believe you are saying hallelujah wherever you are, because this is a marvelous reality. But how could I not continue by also hitting on the death sentence which have to characterize Jesus Christ? Do you know that it was relevant that Jesus Christ also fulfilled the death sentence within those visions? It had to happen, but it wasn't going to happen in silence. Such an important event demanded the broadest possible publicity. Remember, what good would it have been for Jesus to die in Jerusalem if nobody knew about it? Let me ask you, do you think it would have been good? No? Oh yes, it would have been good. I don't think so. I'm kidding. It would have not been good because all eyes needed to be riveted on Jesus as he went to the cross. The publicity was provided by the events of the triumphal entry. I hope you know the triumphal entry. For the sake of of the importance of this study let me give you a gist if you have forgotten matthew 21 verse 1 through 7 i will read speedily follow me closely now when they drew near jerusalem and came to bethage at the mount of olives then jesus sent two disciples saying to them go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied with a coat with her. He said, Lose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled. Note this, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the coat. They laid their clothes on them and set him on them. As we can see in this passage, the triumphal entry was intentionally, listen craftily, it was intentionally staged by Jesus himself. We can clearly see that whatever Jesus Christ gave to his disciples as instructions concerning the donkeys, it was intentional from him. Apparently, if anyone was to blame for a particular disappointment, which I am going to finish the presentation on, it was Jesus Christ. If someone was to blame Jesus that, Brother, we hope that you are going to establish a kingdom. But how is it now that you are crucified? The one to blame was Jesus. Because Jesus knew perfectly well that kings sat on donkeys. Please follow me closely. Jesus knew perfectly well that only kings sat on donkeys in the time of the Israelites. During their colonial slavery under the Roman Empire. Jesus told the disciples to bring the animal. He sat on the animal and allowed the multitude to acclaim him as king, knowing fully well that he was going to be crucified, unlike a fitting king. The truth of the matter is, they were to be bitterly disappointed. The question is, how could Jesus choreograph this event knowing fully well that it would lead the people to better disappointment. And here is where the presentation motive starts from. The fact is, Jesus had repeatedly tried to warn his disciples that he was not the kind of king they were expecting 
but they ignored his words. Up until this time, if you are lost, let me help you recover. I started by inculcating the thought in your head that it is very significant that we follow Christ in the context of the sanctuary. According to the Bible in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophecies, there are several of them, in fact more than half of them that pointed to the ministry of Christ. We have quoted many of them. Then clearly we have seen the fulfillment of these prophecies. Here we are now trying to understand that why would Jesus Christ knowing perfectly that they would be disappointed, acted like a king by sitting on a donkey. And this is the answer we are getting. It is because that Jesus never intentionally wished the followers disappointment because he had repeatedly tried to warn them. How do we justify this? Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 22, we are told, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Indeed, Christ had warned his disciples. He was not the kind of Messiah, the one to continue the corrupt monarchical system. No, like the world expects. He was not the one to continue the Israelite monarchy that they wanted to establish. And for that matter, he warned that he was going to be crucified. Besides, the people had abundant Old Testament prophecies that pointed to his suffering and death, as we all are aware. You know, later in our series, and I would like to give you a break just to think about these things by introducing this particular quote. In later of our series, we will be discussing a lot of disappointments which occurred along the line of the church's history. Do you know that in 1842 and in 1844, God had called a person called William Foy. Not only him, he also called Hazen Foss. Two of them were incorporated to explain what was going to happen in 1844. But the truth of the matter is, they refused to represent or present the message. And this reason, God's people were bitterly disappointed. Friends, it is very clear that the triumphal entry was announced with great fanfare and publicity. We all know that it was a sweet experience. Many of the disciples thought that they were now going to see an established kingdom of Israel. And we are told in Desire of Ages, page 570, here I go. No sooner was he seated on the coat than a loud shout of triumph rent the air. The multitude hailed him as Messiah, their king. Jesus now accepted the homage, which he had never before permitted. And the disciples received this as a proof that their glad hopes were to be realized by seeing him established on the throne. The multitude were convinced that the hour of their emancipation was at hand. In imagination, they saw the Roman armies driven from Jerusalem. And Israel, once more unindependent as it had been, all were happy and excited. The people vied with one another in paying him homage. They were happy. Several people were thronging towards Christ. And it's perfectly clear that everyone who was thronging towards him was having a happy mood. The spirit of prophecy explains once again a very important detail. That as Jesus Christ neared the eastern gate, mind you, remember I spoke about the fact that the priests always came from the eastern side of the tabernacle. In realization of this, Jesus Christ also, even as a sacrificial lamb, neared the eastern gate of the city, and in essence, of the Jerusalem temple, with a crowd greater and ever larger, until their voices of praise could be heard echoing in the hills. The people who had been healed from their paralytics, 
the people who had been healed from their leprosy, the people who had been healed as orphans and widows and carries, were all part of the throng which were following Jesus Christ. And the most interesting thing is that the disciples were the ones leading the choir. The disciples were the people who were giving the morale unto the followers of Christ as he entered Jerusalem. Like just the midnight cry in 1844, the disciples were the ones championing the followers of Christ. Now mark this punchline. Even though Jesus knew that his followers would be deeply disappointed, he strictly stuck to his calendar of events. Listen as I repeat. Even though Jesus knew, yes, he was perfectly aware that his followers would be deeply disappointed, he strictly stuck to his calendar of events. According to Desire of Ages, page 571, once again, the events connected with his triumphal ride would be the talk of every tongue and would bring Jesus before every mind. After his crucifixion, many would recall these events in their connection with his trial and death. They would be led to search the prophecies and would be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And in all lands, converts to the faith would be multiplied. The truth is, Jesus could not have chosen a better time for the triumphal entry and for his death. Because at that time, there was a preparation towards the Passover. The city was bursting with people from all over the world who had come to celebrate the feast. Friends, sometimes you think you are put in the spotlight with your faith tried for nothing. No, we all find ourselves, especially in the context of what I've discussed so far, in our own personal lifestyle, we are found in schools, in our workplaces, during travels, we meet colleagues who are all around us and are fond of us. All these exposures fall in your path that you can showcase your plan and like Christ, focus. But the truth is, as you want to be like Christ, as you want to follow the model of Christ, people will be disappointed and that is the bedrock of the title advent disappointment what am i trying to say let me tell you and reiterate that the people totally misunderstood the event that was going to take place in jerusalem they expected jesus to occupy the literal throne in jerusalem and i'll come back to this literal throne in jerusalem in some few minutes they thought Jesus was going to destroy the Romans and place Israel at the apex of the world. Yes, they, they were correct with time, but they were wrong to the event. In other words, they misunderstood the meaning of Bible prophecy. And this is made clear according to John chapter 12, verse 16. His disciples didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Friends, the final events of Christ's life revealed that he was a king. I hope you know that. The final events concerning the life of Christ he lived in Jerusalem climax the fact that he was not the type of king the people were expecting. Indeed, he would dethrone the present ruler according to John chapter 12, verse 31 through 33. Again, Jesus Christ had his triumphal inaugural procession. He had people leading him and even people behind. That is the characteristic of a king. Yes, once again, according to Matthew 26, 1 through 12, his head was anointed with oil. That is a kingly treat. Once again, a royal crown was placed upon his head. A royal purple robe on his shoulders. The multitude rendered him homage as a king. Remember, they were mocking him when he was being crucified. Once again, a reed was placed in his hand as a scepter. Don't forget the prophecy of Jacob in Genesis chapter 49, saying that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. 
it was Jesus Christ who held that scepter. Jesus was introduced by Pilate, and I believe most of us remember this, as a king. Then once again, there was a mock procession to his coronation. Finally, we all know that an inscription was placed above his cross when he was hanged on the tree. And because of this, Peter quoted David's coronation psalm and applied it to Jesus in Acts chapter 4, verse 25 through 27. Friends, as we have seen, Jesus fully, right on spot, right on time, fulfilled the prophecy of the 70 weeks within the middle of the week. And the prophecy of the Passover, which happens to fall on the 14th of Nisan, that very month, that very day, that very hour of the crucifixion. Unfortunately, there was a disappointment. Less than a week after the triumphal entry, many of those who had sung Psalm 118 verse 26 were bitterly disappointed. They forsook the movement. After the excitement of the triumphal entry had passed, and Jesus had failed to fulfill his expectation, most forsook Jesus and participated in his crucifixion. Now, where am I driving at? Before I drive at where I want to go, let me mark you from this quotation. Mark chapter 15, 12 to 15, the Bible says, So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Friends, when Jesus Christ was going through all this ordeal, he knew that there was going to be a disappointment. In his advent, in his first appearance, as the Son of God without blemish, he knew perfectly that when he had taken upon himself to realize the mandate of the prophecies which were given before his coming, there was going to be a disappointment. Knowing that there would be disappointment, Jesus Christ never lost focus. And listen with rapt attention. You know what? Focus does not sacrifice any force of inhibition. In other words, focus does not meander, unlike politicians after one mess. There are many people in the political sphere who were once focused people. I have many friends who are now within the political circles who back in the olden times, during JSS, SHS and all the likes, were very focused individuals. They could not be bent to the left nor to the right. But when they had now entered into an environment of like-minded people in corruption, they had created a mess. One mess after the other. There are several mates of ours who we know that after one odd decision, they lost focus. Friend of God, you cannot dissipate focus for fear of disappointment. What am I trying to say? Jesus Christ had a calendar. Jesus had a pattern to follow. His prophetic visions, which were given several years before his coming, needed to be fulfilled. And that also had an iota of disappointment for his followers. Right time, right spot through the triumphal entry. And I want to make this clarification that we all, especially when we want to make Christ as our model, are time bound. We are ushered into open spaces, okay? Many of us have the opportunity to stand before people. During our secondary school years, we were privileged to have perfect positions where we were within the midst of gurus. Even now, many of you are applying or trading overseas and wherever you find yourself. You have been ushered into open spaces to make big decisions. Like Christ, you are within the midst of people who are hoping that you join the throne in corruption. You are within the midst of people who are hoping that you establish your throne in the worldly government. But one thing I want to tell you is that you have to disappoint them. Like the advent disappointment, okay? By this, 
many will be disappointed if only you stay focused. Once again, our focus and pinpoint discourse will disappoint many. We cannot show any remorse by sacrificing focus. Now come to think of it, where I left off. Remember I told you that the followers of Christ during the triumphal entry were expecting Jesus to occupy the literal throne in Jerusalem. They wanted him to destroy the Romans and place Israel at the apex of the world once again. And what a disappointment it was. Mind you, as we go through the history of Israel, we can see clearly that whenever Israel was at the pinnacle of its powers, Israel messed up. On several occasions in the repetitive cycle, whenever Israel was fully established as a government, they messed up. In the reign of even the first monarch, Saul, Israel messed up. In the reign after David, Solomon's dynasty messed up. And by that, there was a division even in the kingdom of Israel. To occupy literal Rome seat was that Jesus was going to be exposed to the vows of corruption and a politicized government. What did Jesus Christ do? He disappointed them. By focusing on the mission, by focusing on the prophecies which needed to be realized, Jesus disappointed his followers. I want you to note these very important points. Not all thrones are meant to be taken. Hear me out. Because of that, we will disappoint many. Not all positions, even as we are within a time where visions are rare, expecting an imminent transition to see the kingdom of glory from Christ, we cannot hold every position. And for that matter, we have to disappoint people. We have a focus. Not all love, my dear friends, young people, hear me out. Not all love can be returned for fornication or pleasure. You know, in our current dispensation, if you love a particular lady, the best way to show it is to have a fornicative affair. The best way to bring people closer to you in terms of love, especially for the opposite sex, is to take them out on expedition, which usually results in fornicative gestures. I want to reiterate that not all love can be returned because we have to disappoint certain people. Not all favors can be returned with corruption. And in that state, many of us will find ourselves in positions. Many of us will find ourselves in areas where we have to please people who sent us there. But friends, we have to disappoint them. Like Israel of old, Jesus Christ disappointed many, even though he knew they were going to be disappointed. I want to end by incorporating this story of mine when I had the privilege to travel with Advent Truth missionaries some few years ago in Cancer Chrome. Friends, when I was going to this particular town, I never knew that I was going to meet a particular friend. I had this friend who was living in our house and he happened to be a teacher currently stationed in Cancer Chrome. What I didn't know, I was going to Cancer Chrome with my friends and with my family to spread the word of God. We got to Cancer Chrome and started exploring the land. I remember perfectly Gideon and I were going to and fro for the betterment of the mission. Then lo and behold, even though I wasn't expecting it, I met this friend of mine who was a teacher in one of the public schools in Cancer Chrome. As friends, as brothers, there was an exchange of pleasantries. I said, brother, it's been a while. He responded gladly and told me he had never expected me there. So we had a discourse. Two or three occasions I visited him. But little did he know that what we were going to do in that land was going to disappoint him. Friends, this friend of mine happens to be a non-seven-day Adventist. And because of that, in fact, he met us with cheers and joy. Just as the people of Israel in the time of Christ had met Jesus Christ with all cheers, all praise, expecting him to do something that they would be happy about. 
this friend of mine was so happy. In fact, I remember you told me that, brother, I'm backing you. You guys should spread the word of God. Let the people know that Christ is coming. But little did he know that as part of the messages that we were going to radiate in cancer chrome, we were going to hit, we were going to hammer on the requirements of God's law. Friends, as time went on, day one came, the message fell on the ground. Day two came where we talked about the sanctuary service. Day three came where we spoke about the sacrificial system of Jesus' ministry. Day four came when we hammered on the requirements of the law. And I remember we also spoke about judgment. But when day five, day six, day seven continued, then is where my friend started seeing me in a different light. I remember perfectly that after we were through with the particular presentations, I went home and I saw to my amazement something that happened. This friend of mine had returned from school, packed his things with his wife and left where they were staying. Why did they do so? They were disappointed in me. They never expected that the messages we were going to give was that which was going to take members from their fellowship. In fact, a very close lady who happened to be his friend had left the church because of the radiating power of the messages that were given during that time. What am I trying to say? I'm giving you this story to tell you that practically I understand what Christ is trying to tell us. In times like this, where we are within the liberal lifestyle period, just at the threshold of a transition, many people will be disappointed because we have decided to be focused. Many people will be disappointed because we have chosen that we have to focus in life. It is no surprise that when you are with ladies, they tend to flee because they think you are too spiritual. I'm not saying be spiritual, but I'm trying to tell you be focused. Just like Christ, once again, not all thrones are meant to be taken. Just like Christ, once again, not all positions can be followed. Just like Christ, once again, not all love can be retained. And just like Christ, friends, not all favors can be retained. And I believe that when we do this, people will be disappointed. And in this dispensation, just as we await the transition to receive the kingdom of glory from Christ, there will be an advent disappointment. God bless you so much, friend. Wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, this is where I want to end my presentation tonight. Forgive me for sliding beyond my time. But I want to give you the opportunity once again. Please and please again. In fact, I'm so happy that the network has stayed stable up until now. It means God has been with us. But I want to give you an opportunity. Many of us are within positions where we have meandered from focus. Many of us are now connecting with several people outside the zone that God has placed us. Many of us are taking favors which protrude corruption, even though we know perfectly well that that is not where we are supposed to be. We are failing to disappoint Satan by disappointing God. And we are failing to disappoint the world by disappointing our Savior. The Advent disappointment is not to disappoint God, but is to disappoint those who choose to be against God. Where shall you stand? Father in heaven, we are so thankful. God, you are so wonderful. About 20 minutes before this presentation, I was struggling with the network. But as powerful as you are, you have showcased that indeed, you always want the good things to happen. I believe it is not by mind, but the spirit and the power who leads us throughout our discourse. Tonight, you have spoken to us as you have done previously. Father, on several occasions, many people have disappointed you rather than disappointing the old and the odd. I want to pray and plead that please have mercy on us. 
Personally, I want to plead. On several occasions, I have disappointed you. And I want to plead in the stead of my friends, my brothers, my sisters here, who have also disappointed you. Please, like Christ, let us be focused. Like Christ, let our Advent disappointment be against the evil one, not against you, O Lord. And like Christ, let us realize the times in which we are and prepare for your soon coming. Thank you so much for tonight. May your name be praised in Jesus' name. Amen.